Welcome to Crypto Trader, the world's first televised Bitcoin and cryptocurrency investment show. I am Crypto Man Ran and I'll be your host. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned crypto trader, this is the place to be for all your news, views and ICO reviews. It's been a particularly interesting week on the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency market, with Bitcoin taking the spotlight again. We have a lot to talk about, but first off, let's look at the market indicators. A Bitcoin will cost you 2,700 US dollars. It has been an interesting week for Bitcoin. We started the week at about $2,450 and I saw it hit an all-time high of about $2,905. We're back at $2,700. You need to remember one thing, that if you owned a Bitcoin in the beginning of the week, because of the Bitcoin chain split, you got a free coin. Yeah guys, you got a free Bitcoin cash coins. Those coins are trading today at $628. So that means that if you had a Bitcoin at the beginning of the week, you now have a Bitcoin, which is valued at $2,700, and you have a Bitcoin Cash, which is valued at $628. So the combined value of your holding is $3,328. Not bad for a coin that started the week at $2,450. This renewed buying on the Bitcoin exchange or on bitcoins sent the entire crypto market up with a, to a new market capitalization of 104 billion US dollars. Yes folks, that is over 1.5 trillion rand investments in, invested in cryptocurrencies at the moment. Bitcoin makes up 43.5% of this market cap with a market cap of over 45 billion dollars. Locally, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you can buy it on the local exchange called Luno. You'll pay 38,700 South African Rand. With all the attention over the last week on Bitcoin and the long anticipated chain split, it was the other coins that took a back seat. But now with that out, the other, out of the way, the other coins have come to life. Ethereum, the second largest cryptocurrency, is trading at 221 US dollars. Ethereum's had quite a bumpy ride this week. I saw it trading at 175 US dollars earlier this week. Today it's at 220. I must remind you that if you bought one Ethereum on the 1st of January this year, you would have paid 8 US dollars. Yep, that's right, folks. 3,000% returns in just seven months. In fact, at one point, Ethereum was trading at 400 US dollars. Ripple is another one of these currencies. It's actually my favorite token. It's trading at around 18 US cents. If you would have bought Ripple in March this year, you would have paid one cent per Ripple. Yep, that means that you would have made 18 times your money in just a few months. With numbers like these and over a thousand cryptocurrencies to choose from, no investor can choose to ignore the wild world of cryptocurrencies. Joining me in the studio to help us make sense of this all is Lorian Gamarov. Lorian is a friend and the founder and CEO of Banky Moon, a blockchain and cryptocurrency consulting service. He's also one of South Africa's foremost blockchain and Bitcoin experts. Lorian, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ron. It's great to be here. Lorian, I heard an old adage which said that if you bought $100 worth of Bitcoin in 2008, that would be worth over a billion rand today. Is that true? Hard to believe, but it's true. Did you buy Bitcoins in 2008? No, no, sadly not. When did you buy your first Bitcoins? Uh, the first time I bought them was about the middle of 2011 when it was just under a dollar. And if I promise that I'm not going to tell anyone, would you tell me how many you bought? Well, in those days it was just over a thousand, but sadly I, I spent a lot of them. Well, Lauren, there's been a lot of talk about Bitcoin and most of our viewers don't even know what a Bitcoin is. Tell us, what is this thing called Bitcoin? Well, if you understand how a bank works, then you're almost 90% of the way of understanding how Bitcoin works. So a bank will have a, a database, a ledger with accounts, and those accounts have balances. Uh, and every time you want to spend money at the bank, you have to instruct your bank to now go and move money or a balance out of your account into somebody else's. So Bitcoin works almost exactly the same way. The difference, though, is that we don't have a ledger or database that's stored at a central location like a bank. It's actually distributed around the world, and a group of volunteers are processing processing transactions and doing the same job as the bank. So slow down, slow down. If I want to give you 100 rand worth, I, I want to give you 100 rand worth of money. Of Bitcoin. Worth of, worth of Bitcoin. How do I do it? What do I do? 
Well, you have to have them, but it's quite easy. In the same way that you'd make a digital EFT or something like that, you would get a digital wallet, uh, and there are many of them on the market today. You load it up with Bitcoin, and then you ask for my address, which is like an account number, and then you just go and send it. So today, if I have money in a bank, and I want to give you money, I phone the bank, or I log onto an a, 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 a internet portal, and I transfer money to you using the bank. And the bank has this central computer, which stores the transaction. So what you're saying is with Bitcoin, there's no central computer? Yes. What do you mean? Exactly. So uh, what we have is these volunteers are actually holding a copy, an exact copy of that ledger. And uh, what they do then is they are listening for transactions. And our transaction will be broadcast to the network in the same way you would broadcast an SMS to a network. These, these uh, pr transaction processes, they're called miners, they pick up those transactions and they, every 10 minutes or so they group them together into a block and then they add that block to their database, eventually making a chain of blocks. So to simplify it, I give you a hundred dollars or a hundred rand worth of Bitcoin. Instead of going through a bank, instead of going through one computer, it goes through a whole lot of other computers which are scattered all around the world. Yes, and that's the security that's around this. We don't have a single point of failure. That information is distributed and everybody has to be in consensus, otherwise the transaction is not legitimate. Is that why they call it a chain? Well, the chain is now the group of, the, of transactions called blocks, which are then linked together to build this data structure. And that's why we call it a blockchain. So every time I give you money, I give you 100 Rand, it goes into one block. Later on, you give 100 Rand to somebody else, it goes into another block. And they give 100 Rand to somebody else, and it goes into another block. And that's how they form the chain. Yes, that's the technical understanding. But at the end of the day, what you have is you have a balance on an account. And if you're sending me a Bitcoin, you just say, I want to send, I want to send Ryan a Bitcoin, or Ryan wants to send me a Bitcoin, and you just do the transaction, and then this system works. So there's all these people around the world who have given their computers or their computing power to this network to confirm transactions. That's right. Now, the amazing thing about Bitcoin is that it's a self-sustaining system. They're not just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. What they're doing is they are incentivized by earning new coins that come into the system. And that's how we increase the supply of Bitcoins. And that's how miners earn their... Uh, okay, so it's very, it's very simple. Yes. I give you 100 Rand worth of Bitcoin. Yes. The transaction gets confirmed by these thousands of computers, which mm -hmm. are based all around the world and not in one place. And all these people get rewarded for giving their computer to the network and they get rewarded by giving us Bitcoin. Yes, and that's how the supply is inflated at a very predictable rate and eventually that supply will be, uh, it'll, be uh, it'll end and we'll have a fixed uh, supply, much like gold. And uh, that's what gives Bitcoin that store of value, that it's a finite supply. So all these computers around the world are actually just replacing the bank or, or moving into this period of decentralization where we don't have to have a bank in the middle of every transaction. Exactly, and that's the innovation. And you know, the amazing thing is, is that we shouldn't be surprised by something like Bitcoin. You know, uh, Bitcoin was uh, uh, forecast uh, almost 20 years ago by Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist. He said, the internet is great, but we have this huge problem with payments where we have to now have this trust issue with, with credit cards, which is a very old technology. And he said that what's not invented yet, but will soon be developed is a reliable e-cash. And uh, since those, the, that time, since early 2000, developers and researchers have been trying to create Bitcoin. So the fact that we have it, it's, uh, it, it was an inevitable thing. So quickly, just to wrap up, we've got this digital currency, for lack of a better word. It's called Bitcoin. Where can I buy Bitcoins from today in South Africa? Well, the most reliable place, the best place right now is uh, using a, a Luna.com, which is an online exchange. Uh, what you have to do is you EFT your, your money into your trading account, and then you trade it much like you would trade a stock or trade a foreign exchange. You'll go and buy Bitcoins you'll post bids and offers on, on the exchange. So I go to Luna, I give them RANDs, they credit my account with RANDs, the RANDs mm -hmm. sit there until I decide that the price is right, mm -hmm. and then I press the buy button, mm -hmm. and then I get Bitcoins. Exactly, if you've ever used an exchange, that is exactly how it is. There's a marketplace, buyers and sellers, and people are bidding up the price, and, uh, and uh, exactly as you know. Lauren, we've got so much to talk about, but we've run out of time for today. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, and uh, we look forward to having you on our show again. Great, thank you very much. Speaking of Bitcoin, let's understand the news that moves the Bitcoin price. And this week, the big story in the crypto world news is the split in the Bitcoin chain. Finally, after many years of arguing about how to scale Bitcoin, the community couldn't agree. And so now we have a situation where we are split. In the beginning of the week, if you owned a Bitcoin, you just had your Bitcoin. But after the chain split this week, if you held a Bitcoin, you now got a free 
Bitcoin Cash Coin. Joining us from Silicon Valley in the USA on Skype is Spencer Bogart. Spencer is the Managing Director and Head of Research at Blockchain Capital. I like Spencer because he's a fundamental investment analyst with a history at Wall Street. In fact, when he was at Wall Street, he was one of the only guys that was looking at Bitcoin and wrote the first reports on Bitcoin. Spencer, welcome to our show. Thank you for joining us. What a week it's been for Bitcoin. Thank you so much for having me. After many uh, years of talking about it, the guys have finally split the chain. It means we now have two tokens that came out of the same chain. What does that mean for investors? Yep, it means that investors now have, have coins on both sides of this chain. So they now have Bitcoin and they now have Bcash. So we're calling it Bcash just to separate the two. Um, and so for investors, it means that you know now you have two different sets of coins and you can do with them as you please. So who and when will we know which coin is the better or the more supported coin? I think it's going to take a while for the market to really shake out here. I mean, I think this has not really gone as expected, right? So if we rewind and go back a couple days ago or even maybe a week ago, there was a lot of concern leading up to this fork. And then kind of in the, in the couple of days immediately preceding it, I think a lot of that concern had really faded away and people felt pretty comfortable that this was a small minority separating itself from the network and it was really going to be a non-event. Now, as it's turned out, it's not quite been the case just in the trading action over the past kind of 24 hours. So we've seen you know, Bcash spike up to north of a thousand US dollars per coin. Um, and, and I think that a lot of that is, is really not reflective of, of the actual demand and that uh, most Bitcoin holders haven't had a chance to get their Bcash onto an exchange yet. So just explain to our viewers who don't understand this concept of a fork and a fork split. We've heard the word fork, we've heard the word hard, hard fork. What, what does it actually mean? What, what does a fork actually mean? Explain it to us in, in simple language. Let's just imagine, so again, I'll, I apologize for using an American analogy here, but let's just say I'm here in San Francisco. Let's just say that the city of San Francisco said, hey, instead of using the US dollar, we wanna go ahead and make San Francisco coin. Well, hey, that's great, and every city can go ahead and do that, but it really only matters if, if people decide to go ahead and use San Francisco coin instead of the US dollar, right? So, you know, overall, people get credited with, with coins on both sides. So if I had 100 US dollars before, I have 100 San Francisco coins now. So great, so for now, people who have Bitcoin have got Bitcoin cash coins. We're gonna hold our coins to see what happens, and very soon we'll be able to trade them on an exchange. That's all we have time for, Spencer. Thank you for joining us. Just after the break, we'll take a closer look at the three letters that seem to be giving venture capitalists heart palpitations and sleepless nights. So stay tuned. letters that have venture capitalists everywhere feeling, well, a little uncomfortable. With nearly a thousand new listings this year and over $1.5 billion raised in ICOs, ICOs seem to be the latest disruption to capital raising. Joining me in the studio today is Michael Stannard, Managing Director of Paper Plane Ventures, a venture capitalist firm uh, focusing on advanced technologies. Mike, thank you for joining us. Pleasure, thanks, Ron. ICO, what is an ICO? Yeah, so as you said, a very disruptive new thing and ICO essentially stands for Initial Coin Offering. And uh, basically entrepreneurs and businessmen are raising capital in a new way. And what they're doing is they're going to the market with a cryptocurrency, launching their own coin and you go and buy those coins that gives the, the business coins to work with as capital in their business. Is it like equity? Are you buying equity? Are you buying shares in these companies? So no, you aren't buying equity. You're buying a coin and the coin will be used in a couple of different ways. The most traditional way we've seen them used is that in order to interact with the company to use their services, you have to actually use the coin. So it's the currency that underpins the services of the company. So let's use a, a practical example. I'm a computer game manufacturer. I need to raise, say, a million dollars to develop a game. I go to a venture capitalist. The venture capitalist says he's not going to give me a million dollars because I'm too risky. <laughs> so what do I do? 
Yeah, so the most traditional way that we've seen guys doing this, and as we say, it's a new way of raising capital, uh, you write a white paper, which is basically your business case around why you think people should invest in your business. Uh, and then you have that on your website, generally a couple of videos explaining what's happening. And then investors will come and read that, say, cool, I, I want to invest in Run's new company. I know Run, is great and his business will be great. So basically, I'm this computer game developer. I write this white paper or for lack of a better word, something like a prospectus or a business plan. Yeah. And I post it on my website and then I invite people to buy coins or tokens to play my computer game in the future, yeah? Yes, yeah, so uh, th these tokens have been bought in one of two ways. Uh, some people are buying them because they believe the value of the token will increase. And otherwise you buy the token because you actually want to use the services. So what is the actual use for a token? Actually the token use in my example is just to play the computer game, yeah? Yes, and, and again there are a couple of different ways this works. Some coins like Monaco, they take a percentage of the earnings of the business and that backs the coin. So earnings backing the value of the coin. Other businesses like IOTA, the coin is actually a currency and in order to use that currency you have to own IOTA and that transacts on the network. Mike, we're running out of time but just one more quick question. Have you invested in any ICOs this year? Yes, I've invested in many. I'm, a, I'm an enthusiastic investor. We look forward to chatting about those in our next segment. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Next up, we are going to be crossing over to the only person that I know that is more excited about this show than I am. Brian Leo is the founder of a crypto financial services group called Smith & Crown. These guys are the leaders in market data and insight. Brian, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Rand. Really happy to be here and as you said, certainly excited. Brian, there's been a lot of hype about these ICOs that are happening. Can you give us some insight into the size of the market and what's been happening in the ICO market internationally? Absolutely. Uh, so I think a good place to start with this is uh, last year. So if we look last year is the first year we really saw this as uh, an emergent trend or, or practice in the industry. In total, we had something uh, like 70 projects uh, raise an aggregate about $100 million. So not that large comparatively to uh, traditional financial markets, but still impressive given the early stage of the idea. Uh, we fast forward to 2017 and already this year we've seen over 100 projects that have successfully completed some kind of sale, uh, dozens more on the horizon and many more underway right now. Um, in aggregate, projects this year uh, alone have already raised more than one and a half billion dollars with some projects raising more than 230 million and some of these sales being completed in less than a minute. In less than one minute. Brian, can you give us some insight as to some of the more exciting ICOs that you've seen this year? Sure, uh, th there's been a lot of interesting ICOs. One of the ones we get um, asked about a lot is uh, Tezos. Um, it was the largest um, sale to date and it clocked in at just around 230 million um, at time of close, which is um, obviously a, a pretty significant number, um, uh, no matter how you look at it. Um, so the Tezos was, a, was an interesting one because it's, uh, uh, it's attempting to be a smart contract platform, much in the same way that uh, Ethereum is, for those who are familiar with that, um, with a number of differences, um, mostly being um, on-chain governance and the idea of mathematically verifiable smart contracts. Any other ones that you'd keep a lookout for that have excited you this year? Oh, there, there, there are so many on the horizon um, uh, to take a look at, uh, kind of just across the spectrum in terms of sectors. Um, one thing that I, I think is, is particularly interesting here um, when looking at the, the size of the raise as well as the projects that are coming up um, is the shift we're seeing from a traditional venture as a means of funding these projects um, to the, a raise through an ICO. Whereas last year, the mix between traditional venture funding um, and ICOs favored uh, venture capital. What we've seen this year is that the amount raised um, through ICOs has totally blown away the amount that's been invested through traditional uh, venture means. Um, there's really a clear preference in the space amongst organizations to use this as a means of building their initial user base, um, seeding their initial uh, ecosystem, um, and raising initial capital. Brian, we only have time for one more question. So one more question for you. Why would it be beneficial for a company to do an ICO rather than to sell equity in their business? Absolutely. Um, it, ICOs and traditional equity are different in a variety of ways. Um, one of the only things that we like to say is um, I, I, tokens are, uh, are, uh, are much weirder um, in terms of the properties they can have. 
um, it essentially gives you a lot more flexibility with um, what you can develop. Uh, you can do uh, amazing things in terms of building a, a network um, that have radically different properties than equity. Um, the other thing here is that uh, in a lot of ways, it's, it's not so much about the capital raise it is as it is about creating an initial base of users um, and getting them onto a platform or network. This is really an incredible way uh, to gain exposure, uh, to seed users, uh, and to build an initial community. Um, so it has some really powerful aspects to it uh, that just aren't found in uh, traditional methods. Brian, lots to talk about. We don't have time to talk about it all today, but we look forward to having you back on our show next week. Next up, we're going to be talking to Brock Pierce. This is one of the guys making the big waves in Silicon Valley and disrupting venture capital. Brock, thank you for coming on to our show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Brock, you've been making some serious waves in Silicon Valley. You've been raising a lot of money in these ICOs. Can you give us some insight as to what you've been up to? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I've been in the, call it the Bitcoin or blockchain or Brado crypto community for some time now. And we've been having, uh, you know, an exciting 18 months, and this year in particular has been, uh, you know, quite the uh, roller coaster ride with everything going on with Bitcoin forking. There's two Bitcoins as of yesterday. Um, you know, from an ICO perspective, this new method of sort of um, crowdfunding projects from, you know, uh, interested parties from around the world has been very exciting. From a venture capital perspective, we've uh, made the initial moves that may disrupt that industry forever. Uh, with my firm Blockchain Capital's ICO of the first security called BCAP. But you've had a number of projects this year. Uh, you know, glad to have been helping Bancor. Uh, most recently, Block One with the EOS raise. It's been, uh, you know, a really exciting first six, seven months of the year. Uh, Brock, tell me a little bit more about uh, the BCAP and the BCAP token that was, um, that was floated. Uh, that was designed to disrupt yourselves or the VC market? <laughs> yeah, it, it was. So... Uh, I've been a VC in the space for you know about five, six years now, uh, investing exclusively in startups around this space. Um, naturally, as an entrepreneur, when you see ways to disrupt your own industry, you're left with this concept of the innovator's dilemma, which is do you, as an incumbent, you try and protect the status quo, which usually is working for you at the time, or do you find ways to disrupt yourself? Having been both an entrepreneur and venture capitalist in my career, I, uh, it was only appropriate that I disrupted my own business, and we did that with BCAP. When the idea was to launch a, uh, a digital token that was a, a security in a closed-end fund issued out of Singapore, and um, you know the benefits of doing this versus a traditional fund is that it's uh, it's liquid. So think of it as a digital liquid venture fund. So the main problem that investors have with venture capital, equity, real estate is they don't like their money tied up for five or ten years. Um, so that's the one big problem. And the other is the democratization of the sector. Historically, it's been an asset class only available to call it the financial elite institutions like pensions, endowments, as well as high net worth family offices. And I think the idea of democratizing an industry and making it accessible to everyone is is huge. The old adage was, you know, kind of money is power. Uh, the paradigm is changing and the new paradigm is technology is power. So finally, we can invest in a venture capital fund and we can exit within a day, two days, three days on any one of the liquid exchanges. That sounds absolutely amazing. Brock, we don't have much more time, but are there any other exciting projects that we should be looking at? Anything else that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely be paying attention to the things at Block One and, and EOS. Uh, that's one of the most exciting sort of new projects in the space, but it's not just there. This, uh, this new technology is more disruptive than the internet is. And the advice I'd give to everyone in the world is, you know, try to understand what this is. When you first heard about the internet in the earlier mid nineties, uh, and you started to understand with the earliest of applications, just the benefits of simple things like email. Um, it's something we should all be aware of. And the advice I'd give to people is, you know, get out there, understand it. This is huge. The internet hit 7 trillion during uh, uh, the run up in 99. This sector's at 100 billion and the implications of it are far greater. A very interesting sector indeed. A hundred billion or just over one trillion rand market cap. Brock, thank you so much for joining us. It seems we've run out of time, but join us next week on the, at the same time, at the same place for another jam pack episode of Crypto Trader. Next week, we'll be taking an in-depth look at Ethereum, the cryptocurrency created by the 20 year old Russian that is now trading at a market cap of over $20 billion. Until next week, you can get us on Twitter at CryptoManRun. 
And remember, if you're gonna trade, buy low, sell high. That's the rule.